What if I told you the greatest bantamweight the division had ever seen lost his best years to the brutal weathering of the sport he ruled in? Two knee surgeries, torn groin, broken hands, over and over and over again. Whilst he was sidelined, he watched as competitors took his place, raising a belt that belonged to him. A fighter's story that is being washed away by time. He's a guy who's gone from being the champion to being ranked number 12 without having lost a fight. A man whose bitter feud with his rival shaped the very course of the UFC. You look like a bum. You're irrelevant. Quit talking. It's a chronicle that spans from the gritty days of the WEC to the glittering lights of the UFC. From devastating injuries to a conflict to define an era. Oh, what are you going to do? Chase him down? No. This is the story of Dominic Cruz. A Saturday night in Las Vegas, a precursor for blood to be spilled inside of dingy casinos that are turned into makeshift arenas, WEC26 was unknowingly about to catapult the lighter weight classes of MMA into the stratosphere of notoriety. But the story doesn't start here, it starts with this. The WEC26 Fight Night autographed poster. WEC 26 was stacked. Three title fights, a who's who of future legends, Carlos Condit, Cub Swanson, Eddie Wineland, and our main characters of this story, the WEC featherweight champion Uriah Faber and Dominic Cruz. The importance of this poster cannot be overstated for reasons I'm going to get into, but to fully appreciate why, there are some things that you need to know. So the next five minutes are going to explore the expanse of deep MMA lore. We are going to unearth knowledge and forgotten secrets that will make this story so much more impactful. So buckle in. WEC was a regional organization based out of California, and when the UFC purchased them in 2006, they acted as a kind of sister company that held the smaller weight divisions, featherweight and below. Even in 2007, the UFC was yet to expand its roster below 155 pounds. Owing to the fact that all its fighters were smaller, even the cage that the practitioners fought in was reduced in size, sitting at 25 feet. So, back to the poster. This fight took place in a time where the only thing that opponents knew about each other was their name. There was no tape, there was no long hours of sitting down analysing each other's fight patterns. The fact was, any inclination of what your opponent looked like was from the release of the poster promoting the fight. Dominic would state, I know who I'm fighting, but Faber doesn't know me because I'm nobody. There's no picture of me on the poster. Go figure. So how is he going to recognize me? And there was good reason why Dominic knew who Uriah was. Faber had established himself in MMA four years prior and had notched 18 wins and one loss into his record. He was the current WEC featherweight champion and had been the champion in two other organizations with multiple defenses against the likes of Bibiano Fernandez and Crazy Horse Bennett. Uriah in a short time had become a legend in the sport, particularly for the lower weight classes. Eddie Wineland would introduce Dom to Faber at the beginning of fight week, with Faber rather nonchalantly saying, oh, you're the guy I'm fighting? You might not think so, but that would kick the whole thing off. Dominic would later state, right off the bat, I can't explain it, but that's where this rivalry started. And that leads us all the way to the poster. So Dominic, the up and coming sports athlete, doesn't have enough room to fit on the poster because the card is so stacked. He felt slighted by the promotion and what is perhaps one of the more petty moments from Cruz, but certainly indicative of the legendary trash talk to come, would sign right across Uriah's face on the poster. You can imagine that the loved and highly respected Uriah Faber wasn't best pleased with what Dom had done. Uh, halfway through, he started signing right over my face. You know, we take the home as fighters also and we give them to our coaches and our yeah. friends and stuff like that so uh, I thought that was kind of a, a weird thing for him to do. I don't know if he has a chip on his shoulder or he's just an angry person or what the deal is but. And so within days of meeting each other they go from not knowing a single thing about each other to forming a rivalry and well all that was left to do was to fight. We 
we check in now with Joe Martinez for the official decision. And comes at one minute, 38 seconds of round number one. Submission by Guillotine Joe and still the WAC Featherweight Champion. The fight would be a quick somewhat expected affair, the tough and battle-worn champ would submit the young and inexperienced Cruz within just two minutes to a guillotine choke. With the first taste of defeat in his professional career, Cruz had this to say, I just knew I was going to see him again. That was my first thought. And after I fought him, I was in the back, naturally pretty sad about losing. I was young. This was my first loss. This is nothing, a learning experience. I thought to myself, I needed to go through this. I'll never forget. He walked through the hall and I was sitting with my coaches. I'm looking at the floor and he kind of paused and gave me a look. I don't know if he'll remember, but I do. It's stuck in my head ever since. He looks at me in the room and gives me a smug look, like I shouldn't have even bothered trying. He didn't like me either. He thought I was a punk kid and made his judgments about me at that point. Didn't think I was worthwhile to even be fighting him. If you were there that night, you'd probably think to yourself there is no possible way that a storied and bitter rivalry would stem from this one singular matchup. A feud that would transcend the two men in the cage that night. It would overflow across multiple weight classes and multiple team members. That guillotine choke lit a fire within Dominic Cruz, one that would burn for the next decade. Dominic was mentally preparing himself to cull Team Alpha Male. For those in the know will be well aware that this story will soon descend down a long road of injuries. And that's where my story with today's sponsor begins, Copilot. Recently I've been really struggling with my fitness. I started this YouTube channel after getting stress fractures in both my legs after running far too much. Injured and unable to do the sport that I loved, I turned to making videos. But that obsession with making MMA documentaries created a really unhealthy lifestyle and left fitness behind. And that's where Copilot comes in. It's an app that's literally put me back on track. Copilot is a platform that is designed to help you on your fitness journey. With so much emphasis in modern times on achieving unattainable body images, Copilot is the light in that darkness for people like you and me. The app can be used on your phone or watch, and it pairs you with a personal trainer, like a real life person, a coach to guide you on your fitness journey. I jumped in a call with my coach Mike, and we discussed all the details of what I have access to in terms of gym equipment and my personal circumstances. And Mike went away and tailored a specific workout plan for me to help me return to fitness. So the next day, I get my my first workout perfectly aligned with what I want to achieve. I don't have to think or question anything. I just follow the app's instructions and let it guide me through a workout. It's just completely user friendly. It even has a visual aid so you know you are doing the exact thing that you are meant to be doing and not making any mistakes. And when you are done you provide feedback to your coach. Copilot found that their clients are nine times more likely to stick to their workout goals because of the way the app harmonizes with your individual lives. And now I find I'm way more consistent. In fact I haven't even missed a workout which means I'm healthier, happier, and more motivated in life generally. And that for me is the main selling point. It's not about looking a certain way or hitting a particular number in a lift or a time in a run. It's about accountability. It's all about consistency, something I have particularly needed after dropping out of running. There is a link in my description and in my pinned comment. It's go.mycopilot.com mix martial academic. If you click that link, you'll get a free trial with an expert fitness and health coach. If you are looking for help staying on track, getting fitter and getting healthier, then give Copilot a go like I did and see the massive benefit that it can bring to your life. So thanks once again to Copilot for sponsoring this video and let's get back to the documentary. After his defeat, Dominic would make his way down to his third weight class, Bantamweight, a place that would become his home for the remainder of his fighting career and a place where he was soon to find dominance. Since his loss to Faber, Dominic had gone 7-0, winning the WEC Bantamweight Championship and defending it once. It was during this three-year run through the WEC Bantamweight division that Dominic would score two victories over one of Team Alpha Male's stars, Joseph Benavidez. 
Vicariously through one of Uriah's men, Dominic had not only settled the score, but notched himself one up. Cruz was distancing himself from that younger and inexperienced fighter that had stepped in and lost to Uriah those few years ago, and was instead settling into becoming a dominant and undefeated bantamweight. But there was news on the not so distant horizon that was going to change the smaller weight classes forever. Ariel Hawani standing alongside the president of the UFC, Mr. Dana White. And uh, Dana, thank you so much for the time today. Um, I want to take you back to July. That's when I first heard a rumor that WEC was merging with the UFC. And since then, I've gathered a lot of information. Now I confidently present it to you and I ask you the question, is WEC merging with the UFC? Yes. When? <laughs> the last fight for the WEC will be uh, in December. October 28th, 2010, the merger begins. Jose Aldo, the featherweight WEC champion, is promoted to the inaugural UFC featherweight champion, and Dominic Cruz will face Scott Jorgensen at the final WEC event in December 16th of that same year. The winner will claim the final WEC bantamweight championship, and at the exact same time have the inaugural UFC bantamweight strap wrapped around their waist. The event would signal the finalization of two new weight classes joining the UFC, taking the total to seven different weight limits. The UFC was expected expanding, and as its roster of fighters grew, it only made more sense to add more weight classes. At this point, the WEC had done all the work putting the smaller weight divisions on the map, but ultimately, they would fade into the annals of history, just another victim of the UFC monopoly. But its place in the archives of the sport cannot be understated. Uriah Faber and Jose Aldo had quickly become household names for any casual viewer, and had rightly become the inspiration for smaller fighters across the globe. The UFC's aggressive growth had consumed pride and strike force, and presumed presumably made any number of competition fade into obscurity. It's a shame most fans of MMA won't ever remember the WEC for what it was, the organisation that provided a platform to see the rise of Donald Cerrone, the Showtime kick, the Korean zombie, and Jose Aldo's four second destruction of Cub Swanson. Time was running out for the WEC, and the 53rd event would roll around in a final waltz. Dominic Cruz would win his title fight against Scott Jorgensen, and be crowned as the first and last of two different organisations. The WEC bowed out of the sport forever, left to fade into abstract memory as the UFC trudged onward towards supremacy. The UFC's first step in making their bantamweight history would begin by buying into a narrative that had its foundations laid all those years ago at WEC 26, the rematch between Uriah and Cruz. See, Uriah after beating Dom would continue to cement his legacy by defending his featherweight belt multiple times, but not before coming up against two men who would show Faber that he was punching above his weight, Mike Brown and Jose Aldo. See, Uriah wasn't a natural featherweight, in fact he was one of the smaller guys for the weight class, but because he had gone untested he had no reason to move back down to the weight class that he had started in. But after suffering three losses, one to Aldo and two to Brown, a move down to bantamweight, the division Cruz currently ruled over made sense. After gathering two wins over Mizugaki and Eddie Wineland, Faber had perfectly and rather fittingly set up the first bantamweight title fight in the UFC. The fight was slated for UFC 132 in July of 2011, and despite the years that had flown by, Dom's and Uriah's rivalry hadn't gone anywhere. He's the poster boy, and I know it. It, and everybody else knows it for the WEC at that point and the WC doesn't even put my face on the poster just my name and fine print at the bottom and Uriah's big chin right there just sitting on the poster and it just pissed me off I said man what's this all about I'm good enough to fight him for the title but I'm not good enough to be on the poster I'm gonna be on this poster I signed right there on his face and I'll never forget I'm sitting in the room and my head's down he walks by and he, I don't even know if he remembers this, but I do because it's stuck in my head. And he's like, oh, good fight, bro. Like that. And he kind of looked at me like, yeah, you, you know, you signed on my face on the posters. That's what happens. And he walked off. And I'm like, all right. All right. Um, this is just another fight for me. It's just another matchup. And that's how that's the mindset I'm going in with. You know, I, I haven't seen your eye in four years. And, um, you know, we've changed a lot, both of us. And I've done everything I can possibly do um, from beginning to end for the past 12 weeks to win this fight. You know, you put Dominic and I in the, in the same uh, little neighborhood and, and we probably would have ended up fighting each other, you know, because, you know, his bad attitude and me not taking crap uh, and me being the better dude, 
you know, and that's what this is about, so. I think it's obvious when watching the two interact that whilst they clearly don't like one another, there is certainly a level of respect between the two. Uriah had given a name to all the lower weight classes, and that wasn't lost on Cruz. And to Uriah, Dom had clearly matured into a dominant and skilled champion, good enough to take out one of his own surging teammates. But that thin layer of disdain boiling below the surface wasn't going away, and the intensity of the stare down was the physical manifestation of years of history coinciding for one moment moment, one fight. Dominic Cruz would edge out Uriah in a close fought fight of the night, handing Uriah his first loss in the UFC. Cruz had finally claimed back the only loss on his record, a loss that had been burned into his mind for four years, one that had propelled him to become a world champion. Getting that win back must have been a crowning moment for Cruz's career, the culmination of years of effort, persistence and ultimately sacrifice, those long days spent grinding in the musty bowels of some gym in San Diego, intent on one thing, revenge. Despite the judge's decision, Uriah felt that he had won the fight, and considering the shallow history of the bantamweight division at the time, assumed that he was just one win away from a rubber match with Dominic, a rematch to determine who in fact was the better man inside of the cage. And to be fair to Uriah, they were one and one, and well for those who care about the underlying story, Dominic was now three and one against team alpha male team members. The division would carry on moving at a fast pace, Dom later in that year would defend his belt against future potential GOAT Demetrius Johnson, and Uriah would choke out former WEC bantamweight weight champion Brian Bowles in a title eliminator, perfectly setting up the rubber match. But this rivalry was about to take a route into familiar territory. The UFC wanted to capitalise on the final chapter between these two bitter rivals. Their feud was the fuel to legitimise the bantamweights in the organisation, and so to round off the trilogy, both competitors were placed in the melting pot of the ultimate fighter. These are your coaches. Current world champion Dominic Cruz, former world champion Uriah Faber. What? What? What's up with you? You little chip today or what? Man, I always got a chip. I know you do. Yes, yeah, it's just right here. I already Knock told you you're not going to off, dog. No, you don't understand. You say you understand and you don't listen. In order to understand, you have to listen. Shut up and listen. Great Man, job, so Tickle. Asleep. You did good, bud. Favor, don't let anybody get you down. Say, man. Nobody, nobody cares what you say. Don't let anybody get you down. Stay out of it. Hey, you're listen. a warrior. Favor, just want you, you to know, nobody cares what you have to say. Why don't you get out of here, you're man? Nobody cares. You look like a bum. You're irrelevant. Quit talking. Go get oh, in your Go get your grandpa's Mercedes and go home. The show proved to drive a wedge further between the fierce competitors, and over the course of its airtime, we would see more heated moments between the two. The show was a massive success, and its numbers were guaranteed the coaches to become stars at the end of it. The final for the show and their third matchup at UFC 148, co-headliners of Anderson Silva and Chael Sonnen's hyped matchup, was the perfect platform to make the winner a pay-per-view cash machine for the UFC, but it also served as a meaningful and impactful conclusion for the two men that had such a long and bitter feud. first started fighting, there was only 155 and up. It wasn't 135, 145 didn't even, it didn't even exist. So the fact that, uh, you know, that the things that he did at 145 pounds made made him the person to be. And uh, I was 9-0 and at the time, and I fought him, and, and I lost. And, you know, that put me on a, just, it gave me tunnel vision, you know? You're living right now because there's rules in MMA. If yeah, there so weren't. You're going to go there again, man. Well, you I'm just saying. A, you wouldn't have a leg. Is that intimidating? This is you, you got slept by Mike Brown. You There's a lot of people that let you live in that mindset. Wrong. You're, Right. Fate, however, would have other plans for these two athletes, and as the show neared its conclusion, the start of an historic and brutal journey for Dominic Cruz would begin. The first domino to fall in one of the darkest storylines the sport has to offer. Normally I come over here for either good or bad This is the bad Dominic blew his knee out. So I'm sure everybody's heard the terrible news, Dominic tore his ACL. And I'm actually lucky that that's all I tore. Uh, a lot of times people tear ACL, meniscus, LCL, all kinds of stuff at the, all at once, one clean swipe. The doctors are telling me about nine months, I think GSP is taking about 11 so far. You got to take all the time you need because when you're competing at a, at, a, at a championship level, you have to be 100% fighting against these guys. I'm just waiting to hear what happens. I'm thinking a interim title, he's been out almost a year and a half now. Once this surgery goes through, it's going to be another nine months. 
So I'm, I'm uh, hoping for a top top contender. Renan Burrell, in my opinion, is, is next up. We didn't want this to leak out. Your opponent is Burrell. We're off, boys. And then July 7th, Uriah Faber, Henan Burrell. Who are you picking? Maybe not who you want to win. And I have a feeling it may be Uriah just so that you can meet again, but who are you picking? Uh, I think Faber's actually going to win. I think that uh, uh, he takes down. The new UFC interim bantamweight champion of the world, Henan I mean, how's, how's your psyche? It seems like it's really good. I mean, this is a pretty pretty big injury and a, and a blow. I know you were excited to get in there and do this trilogy. Yeah, I mean, of course I'm excited. Of co uh, I was excited to fight Faber in, in the situation that we were in, but, I mean, what am I going to do? I can't sit here and just be mad at myself all day about an injury that happens when you're training. So, I mean, recover. That's all I can do is work on my knee and recover. 2012 would welcome Henan Burrell to the top of the division as he claimed the interim title from Faber in a dominant decision at UFC 129. Uriah would lose his second attempt at UFC Gold and Burrell would extend his winning streak to 29. The expectation that the California kid would rule at bantamweight in place of Cruz was shattered by a ferocious Brazilian on a crash course up the pound-for-pound -pound rankings. Dominic would watch on the opposite side of the cage, recovering from his ACL surgery and was expected to return against Burrell at the end of the year. Unable to defend his belt and earn money inside the cage, Dominic would turn to the analyst desk, a place where he would quickly become one of the greatest minds in the sport. Does he get back up? He can get back up. How do you beat him? How do I beat him? I beat him whichever way I want to beat him. Which means what? If we want to stand, you can watch my fights, you can see it, I box. So you're going to box elbows. him or are you going to wrestle him or are you going to mix it? You know what? Top uh, fights Top to come. Five. Six fights to come on the card. Chief We're going to preview the action ahead. And gentlemen. As the end of 2012 drew closer, Dom was finally allowed to train again and would soon be cleared to challenge the man ready to usurp him. And I was training on Christmas. How many months after the initial surgery? Six. So it's real recent. It's probably not 100% healed yet. It's not 100% healed yet. It was kind of like, you know, I was boxing in my brace. I had it taped. I, I warmed up. I Were stretched. You sparring? I was uh, doing drills, boxing drills. Just drills. Yeah, boxing wow. drills. And I made a, I made a cut, like a turn, and it just popped. So I sit down and I go, all right, my knee's torn. And that was when I hit like a real bad rock bottom on that one. And I'll never forget that day. It was like New Year's Eve. I sat on the mat and just looked at the floor knowing I had to restart that nine months again. It was heartbreaking. And then you realize, who's around you for those things you had. The girl leaves. Sponsors start falling off. I mean, it all got taken from me. I'm in a hurt spot right now. And uh, the love that I get from, from the, <coughs> excuse me. I had my depression that, that was hitting me. And, and that's, so many people in this world are dealing with depression. Like it's a huge, catastrophic problem across the planet and it's something that everybody not just myself deals with on a daily basis I think in certain people's lives and that hit me very hard and I didn't understand why it hit me so much harder now after I stopped competing like why am I why is why is it so much worse now well the reason is my body was used to the active the activity just go 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 and I what I realized is I turned off all my emotional spiritual and mental issues with exercise to where I never, ever, ever dealt with them, ever. Mm. I only physically worked them out. So my physical was perfection. I was a, I'm a world champion, monster killer, whatever you want to call me in your own respective mind, right? But emotionally, physically, and spiritually, I was a cricket. And I never understood that until I was hurt, trapped in my own body like a prison cell couldn't train, couldn't run, couldn't walk, couldn't bend my leg, laying on the couch, eating pain pills, realizing, man, unless you train, unless you compete, you hate yourself. You hate yourself. You're, you're a piece of in your own mind without those things, without the beautiful girlfriend, without the beautiful house, without the nice cars, without the big money to show people. You hate yourself. 
I lost sight that the whole reason we're fighting is is it's a spiritual, emotional, physical, mental battle that helps you grow as an individual and as a human being. It's not just to have these things that you think will make you happy. You have to learn those things through the process. And I didn't know that until I was trapped in my own body. And I literally felt like I was in a prison cell for three years. So how did you get yourself out of it? By just accepting it? And you, you mu there must have been some sort of a mechanism that well, you I got, used. I have people that I talk to, professionals. It's a mental floaty. And it's okay because we all hit low part, low points in our life where it's unbearable. And you either allow it to continue to be unbearable and just deny it, or you deal with the task at hand and say, I'm a little low right now. I need the floaties. It's okay. I'll get through this. And then when you take the floaties off, you realize I only needed them for a little bit of time and now I'm okay. I'm here. And that's kind of what it felt like. It's like, I just needed a little bit of a push. I need to get through this and learn some things about my own, my own mind and understand my own emotions and understand that I didn't need all these things that I was thinking weren't real it was me not being in control of my own emotions your own emotions are your choice and I chose to feel trapped I chose to be sad I chose to feel like I was jacked I chose all these things and it's like you don't need fighting to be these things you need to you need to let go of fighting to learn that you are something without it there are a few words to describe the position that Dominic was in. That palpable darkness, a constant threat to his own physical and mental health, a plague that seemingly can affect each and every one of us and drag us to our lowest moments. And that thought of those suffering, about to give up because of life's ceaseless tide of worry, setbacks and unfortunate circumstances, gave Dominic a reason to continue to fight, to show that demons can be conquered and that our best selves are forged in the melting pot of life. He wanted to return to the top of the sport to prove that if he he can do it, then we all can. And so helpless, sidelined, unable to compete and defend his title, he would watch as Burrell would put his interim title on the line twice in 2013. First against Michael McDonald, and second against former WEC bantamweight champion Eddie Wineland, retaining it in both outings. The UFC staying true to their injured champ would keep Dominic on the throne as bantamweight king, and as 2013 drew to a close, the UFC once again anticipated Dominic's imminent return. Over two years removed from the sport, Cruz was finally expected to step foot inside the cage once more. Has anyone from the UFC talked to you about a timetable of when they want you to return or when they think you have to return? Um, you know, I'm looking to be back beginning uh, early next year in, in 14. And uh, I can't give an exact date because the truth is I haven't been even cleared by the doctor. I finally get back to health after the second ACL. Six months, nine months goes by. All right, let's take this Burrell fight. So I'm ready. I'm training in camp about a month in. I remember I was sparring one day and I went to throw a right hand and my leg just gave out and I fell on the floor. I tore the, the muscle, the quad muscle off the bone. Oof. So it like separated from the bone, but it wasn't all the way. It was just enough that it was, I could still like think I was okay, but it would just fail on me occasionally. So I ended up calling Dana and and it's one of the few phone calls I've ever had with Dana, unfortunately. And this is probably one of the times he remembers is telling him, I'm sorry, I got to pull out. So the UFC pulls me, you know, Dana's naturally pissed, but then that slides uh, Faber in there. Boom, Faber gets the, the shot with, with Burrell, ends up getting knocked out in that matchup. But um, I pull out of that fight, and that's when they strip my belt. And then that was the beginning of me giving up on fighting to an extent. Cruz, after another catastrophic setback, wrestled with the reality that he might never fight again. The string of injuries were perhaps a sign from the universe that he wasn't meant to be fighting. Uh, my higher power is God, so I'm praying at this point, saying, I don't know what you want me to do. So you're talking to God, saying, yeah, like, what do I got to do? What do I got to do, man? I'm do I, you want, I, I'm, I'm in this for, for reasons bigger than myself. I want to come back and, and show people this can be done. I, I'm not the only one that can do this. Anybody can do this, right? I'm here for you, doing bidding your will, God. This is my talking. And no answers, no nothing. And I said, maybe that's the answer. I remember thinking, maybe that's the answer. It's just, you might not ever fight again. Are you okay with that? And that was something that my I never allowed my brain to even go to, ever, until all these injuries hit me and I would have never been able to unless I went through all that. The UFC after so many years of sticking with Dom were forced to let go of him as a champion and as such the division would continue to move on, this time with Barrow as the undisputed champion. Just a couple months after defeating Uriah, Barrow would be matched up against an up-and-coming team alpha male prospect 
TJ Dillashaw. The fight was put together in a scramble after the original headliner was scrapped. TJ taking the fight on somewhat short notice was placed as a huge underdog. After all, a man who had gone 5-2 and two in his UFC career so far certainly didn't stand much of a chance against a fighter who many were considering the pound for pound number one in the world. But this sport would hold true to its ruthless and mysterious ways by providing one of the greatest underdog wins of all time. TJ handily beating Baral via TKO in the fifth round. It's hard to imagine how Dom must have felt seeing Team Alpha Male claim his throne, but perhaps it didn't bother him as much as you would think, because Cruz was embarking on a spiritual journey inwards. Cruz was letting go of his athletic identity. When I did that, my health skyrocketed immediately. I started, I just went to therapy every day knowing I was trying to get better, but I didn't care if I fought again or not. I focused all my energy in Fox. And when I did that, it took away so much importance off of needing to fight as have the title as my as the person that I was that it allowed me to open up and say if you never fight again you're still a great person you still did great things you still uh, laid the tracks for the bantamweight division in a lot of ways um, you did this that you, you had a great career Dom. like it's okay if this is it and I kept that mindset kept focusing on the things that I could control instead of the things that I couldn't like the fact that I wasn't competing yet and as I did that I got healthier and healthier came back that set me up to fight Mizugaki it was only after letting go and surrendering himself to fate that the world would come back together piece by piece. Years of suffering and agony, losing his prime years to injuries, offered Dominic freedom in a way that wasn't so obvious at first. It was only when he unshackled his self-imposed chains that health would find him and a return fight was booked. A mirage on the horizon, a shimmer of gold awaiting his return, the light in the darkness. He's a guy who's gone from being the champion to being ranked number 12 without having lost a fight. All of it due to inactivity, all of that inactivity due to injury. It's one of the worst chains of events, one of the worst series of bad luck I've ever seen in all my years of watching UFC fights. I think that Dominic Cruz has faced more adversity in being injured than any other fighter we've seen in the history of mixed martial arts. Dom, it's been over a thousand days since you last fought. How does it feel to finally know that that weight is finally coming to an end? I don't know really how to take it. I just have to uh, take it one day at a time until I make weight. And now I'm just excited to be here. You get an opportunity in this fight to see where Dominic Cruz is at mentally. What has this long layoff, what kind of toll has this taken on him? If he can beat number six ranked Takeya Mitsugaki, and if he can show the same skills that he had when he was the bantamweight champion of the world, he will do what no one has ever done before. Fight after a long layoff and get right back into title contention. Is it weird not being here with a belt though? It's been a while. No, I mean, the belt's just a piece of metal. I still got it in my heart. You still consider yourself the champion? I still consider myself one of the best on the planet. I believe that about myself. If you don't, you're going to get your butt kicked in that cage, man. You will. You, you have to believe that about yourself. Any reservations at all that you might not look like the same Dominic we saw three years ago? I have no reservations of that at all. Is there a chance you might even be better? I sure hope so. We're about to find out very soon. Two days. I'm far from the old Dominic. A lot of things are better, you know, nothing's worse. I'm, I'm ready to be back and I'm ready to have that belt. That was the most at peace I've felt in a long time walking well, into that I, fight. I remember interviewing you after the fight and you were like, I don't even remember what happened. Yeah. Like you just went, like you went into a trance. It was weird. It was one of the weirdest performances of my whole career. I was just there to enjoy being there again after three and a half years and all these injuries. Like, I can't believe I made it here. I'm not injured. By letting go, man, by letting go of the injuries, by letting go of the win, by letting go of the loss, by letting go of either mattered, I was in, this, I was in my zone. 
and it allowed me to just be free. And I was that was the best performance of my career. But more than anything, it showed me a mental thing that I'd never opened up before. And it was um, letting go of the things that you can't control uh, will give you actually more peace. It was the most amazing, most ferocious and spectacular version of Dominic Cruz we'd ever seen inside the octagon. Unfortunately, right after that fight, he blew his knee out again. Bantamweight champion Dominic Cruz has suffered another ACL injury. Frustrated injuries, the knee goes and it goes again. This whole thing I'm being put through, all these tests, all these things, I'm being put through it because I'm the one who's tough enough to handle it. Dom, after one of the craziest roads back to the fight game, had firmly positioned himself in line for the next shot at the title with a spectacular first round finish. But Cruz yet again would be sidelined for another year. He would fade once more out of the spotlight and watch as Team Alpha Male's TJ Dillashaw would yet again defend the belt that belonged to Cruz, once again finishing Barrow in a rematch. It's hard to put into words how Dom must have felt, that crushing sense that his own body was sabotaging his best years, his chance at securing greatness in the sport slowly slipping away. Time would continue to tick, and after many more months of rehab and rest, Dom would receive an unlikely phone call. And I remember I was on a boat, you know, I was 175 pounds fat, out of shape, trying to just resting my body and getting my, I, it had been exactly seven months since my surgery, and they asked me to fight at the nine, ten month mark, which meant that I would have been 100%, and Sean Shelby asked me if I wanted that fight. And I remember I was drinking beers on a boat, on literally on antidepressants at the time. Fat, miserable. And that fight, I remember, I was kind of hammered, so I was like, yes, I'll kill him, let's go. And then I get uh, uh, done with that day, and I'm like, holy shit, I just booked a fight, and like, I'm really fat. DJ Dillashaw and Dominic Cruz are pretty much very evenly matched and it really could go either way on Sunday. What do you expect the final outcome will be? It's what makes this fight so fun. You know, Dominic Cruz has never lost the belt. You know, he, he had injuries and had to give it up. And Dillashaw has been ripping through everybody who, uh, you know, Dominic Cruz would have had the fight. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the most important fight we've ever had in the Bantamweight division. Uh, he's just a talker, man. You know, he's just going to try to organize this because I don't need to. Why? Because I don't want to. I think walk. you're scared to talk, to talk because you don't want to say what you're going to do because you're scared to eat your words. All right, man, I'm done talking to you. You can't be done talking to me. You're right here facing <laughs> me, dummy. I'm you got to talk to me. You have no choice. You got nowhere to go. Keep talking. He's talked a big game about him being a martial artist and Mr. Nice Guy, but the truth down inside is he's a real You know what I mean? He, he, he's fake. You know, to be the man, you got to beat the man. So for, for Dillashaw, He's got to beat Cruz, and for Cruz, Cruz wants to solidify that, that he's the greatest ever in that weight division. So Faber wasn't relevant? No. He was your teammate? He's not. But you've he always been beating him up, right? You've always been I beating up have. all your teammates, huh? Yeah, I've been doing a great job, yeah. You're fake, man. Uh -huh. You're a fake person. You, you pretend to be cool with people, but you're not. And that's why I don't mind talking to you, because you're fake. You're not real, man. You're like Mr. Nice Guy, but it's not real. Can't come soon enough, man. I'm ready to shut this guy's mouth. 2015 would be a turning point for Team Alpha Male. Their homegrown star and champion was outgrowing the gym that had brought him to the pinnacle of the sport. Enticed by money and the fact that Dwayne Ludwig was moving to Colorado, TJ had a hard choice to make in the build up to his fight with the lineal champion, Dominic Cruz. Stay with his mentor, the man that pulled him out of college, Uriah Faber, or follow his new head coach across the country to start anew. I think that, uh, you know, his best shot at beating me is to go ahead and drop somebody else out of the corner and keep Dwayne and go up to Colorado and hope that he can have his sensei time up there with, with, with Dwayne over here because if he's got favor anywhere near that corner, he's gonna have a bad night and that's been proven. I've proven it before. I think Dwayne would agree with me, wouldn't you? <laughs> Where's the little snake? Where's the little weasel? It's almost like storybook perfect timing for it to come out on Ultimate Fighter and it just to be super dramatic and obviously make the episodes a little more entertaining. What are you gonna do? I'll do something about it. Well, do something then. You ain't still there. That's up to him to man up and realize that. It was around this time last week, Monday of last week, that you informed some of the 
the members of Team Alpha Male that you'll be going to Colorado for your next camp, in particular, uh, Elevation Fight Team. But everyone's like, oh, they're not just my teammates, they're my family. They're your co-workers. And they can be your friends in addition to your co-workers, but they're not your family. And I look at your Instagram, I look at your Twitter, and yeah. I can't help but feel bad. I mean, every time you do something, it's the snake emoji pops up. And I, I mean, does it get to you at any point? It's, it's not the greatest, you know? I feel that, you know, Uriah took it a little bit harder than I thought he was going to take it. You know, TJ is a very brutal uh, teammate. You know, we, we, re we accepted that for a long time, but... What do you mean brutal? I mean, he has a temper in, in, in practice. He can elevate things and um, isn't always the most considerate when it comes to other people's well-being. You know, on top of that, his managers probably tell him, you, you leave the team, now you can fight your eye. That's the biggest fight in the division, period. Is this a fight you're comfortable as far as skill versus skill is concerned? Absolutely. The thing is, it doesn't surprise me because there can only be one. And, you know, TJ said it himself that in his mind, he's been beating up Faber for years. He said that. I didn't say it. He did. And then you got Ludwig also in the mix for a second, where Ludwig wants to be the coach. He wants to be the guy who invented TJ Dillshaw. He wants to be the guy who invents all these guys at Alpha Male, makes them better. There can only be one yet again. So it was a matter of time before that whole thing fell apart because they're just a bunch of meatheads trapped in one room. TJ had made his choice, and if you want a full breakdown of that situation, far more in depth than what this documentary provides, then please check out the companion video to this one on my channel. It's another super long in-depth video about TJ's rise and conflict with Team Alpha Male, but this video focuses on the perspective of Dominic Cruz, a man who was finally about to make his comeback after almost five years without a title fight. The majority of it spent injured, and he was returning to the top of the division to take on a man who had claimed the throne in his absence. The narrative going into the fight unsurprisingly was one of ring rust and one of age. Dom had lost the best years of his career on the sidelines, and returning to take on a champion after so long off is considered simply impossible, no matter how good you are, something the odd makers agreed on with Dominic coming in as the underdog of the night. But for those who are listening, Dominic in those years had built a mentality carved from stone. He had gone to a place very few people will in a lifetime, and a return with an unbreakable spirit, testing his mettle against a team alpha male prodigy, a man who had styled his fighting patterns after Dom himself, wasn't some cathartic end to a long and arduous journey. No, it was simply the embodiment of the journey there, a manifestation of those long, depressed nights broken by the sport he loved. That road from years of setbacks to stepping into the octagon, finally healed in mind, spirit and body, was the achievement. Beating TJ was a footnote for Dom, and all that was left to do was to fight, was to prove those doubters wrong. The injuries, the ups and downs, the setbacks, can you put into words, three days out, what's going through your mind? The goal of this whole process that I've gone through is to evolve because that's the only option I had was to either sit in sorrows and be sad that I lost some prime years or use them to the best of my ability to become a better man and then see what that gets me at the end of it. Here I am. I'm getting ready to, to put it all to a test and against a good opponent. I have TJ Dillashaw winning the fight. Look, Dominic Cruz has fought once in four years. What he's attempting to do is something we've never seen in this sport. Nobody can take away what I know I've done to prepare for this fight. Nobody can say that I'm not ready and I can't win. I know the amount of work and dedication and sacrifice I've put into this time. Dominic Cruz, TJ Dillashaw. Emotions running very high. Take down. Big takedown for Cruz. First takedown of the fight. Dominic's got his back. Good right hand of the both times. Oh, he rocked Cruz. He just got rocked with the right hand. Cruz Good with a left hand. hand. Cruz. Short check hook. Oh, oh man, that oh. high kick. Head kick right over the Scores it 49 46 for the winner by split decision and new UFC undisputed bantamweight champion of the world, Dominic the Dominator. What a moment for Dominic Cruz. 
There couldn't be any more truth to the words Rogan used when starting the post-fight interview with Cruz after winning the belt in the greatest comeback the sport had ever seen. Joe spoke of Cruz enduring an odyssey. He spoke of how Cruz had been tested mentally, tested in his resolve and resilience. Dominic had come back from one of the darkest places an athlete can descend to, everything taken away from him over the course of a gruelling and destructive four years. Every step forward was met with two backward steps, but it was only after letting go that the universe began to make sense. Loosening that grip of control, of frustration, of high expectations, that was the path to freedom. Dom shows us that after losing everything, it is possible to strive valiantly back to the top, utilising persistence, will and courage. And as Dom lifted the leather strap glinting aureate weaves under the stadium's lights to a crowd of cheering onlookers, he was finalising a long and arduous journey back from the pits of despair, a place that has swallowed many men and never let them return. He did so whilst at the same time shutting down another challenger that had once hailed from the gym walls of Team Alpha Male, another victim of Dom's ruthless culling of a team that seemingly would not leave the division. To that end, Team Alpha Male was still clinging on in the top echelon of the division, and in the build-up to the fight with TJ, Uriah had been setting himself up for a title shot. Since losing to Baral two years previously, Uriah had gone 3-0 at Bantamweight, and considering the fallout between him and TJ, he had been pining for a shot at the winner of the matchup. Cruz, you gotta give it to him. I mean, what a journey he's been on. He's a real champion. He's a true champion. Let's do it, Dom. This has been a long time coming. I've been sticking around <laughs> a couple extra years just to let you heal up, buddy. You're not made for battle. I don't even want to talk about that guy. I'm still talking about him. And so considering the long and eventful history between Dominic and Uriah's camp, it was finally time to put an end to the decade-long rivalry. Years of competition and still fate had kept both Dom and Faber in close orbit. And now, as chance would have it, they were destined to collide one final time. Cruz, perhaps in spite of the fact that he had been sidelined for so long and was finally healthy, wanted a quick turnaround, and the UFC was more than willing to provide the matchup. And if you thought that the hatred and bitterness would have quelled in the many years this rivalry had played out, then you would be dead wrong. Yeah, already the talk has begun for a rubber match, of course, with you. And uh, when they told this to Cruz, he said, let's get him out of my face first and out of the way so I can continue to clean out the division. I mean, for the last 10 years, the only thing that they've been talking about with me is a fight with Cruz. The co-headliner on UFC 199 on June 4th will be the dominator, Dominic Cruz, completing his trilogy against the California kid Uriah Faber. This is a 10-year rivalry. I've had to deal with this guy, man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Unbelievable. I think, I think we probably have the oldest rivalry in the sport it's right now. It's kind of weird. It's like... When you dislike somebody, it's weird how they just stay around you somehow. <laughs> you didn't rock me three times. These are all your own assessments of what happened in that fight. Watch the fight. Everybody you're at home completely watch the fight delusional again. about everything. That's how you get through. You don't talk right. about what you do wrong. You only talk about what you think you do they right. They better separate us in a small in a small room. That's bad news for him. For Anything sure. short is to your advantage. That's for sure. <laughs> are you a Whoa. big tall guy, bud? Well, I'm worried and that's about what's going to happen. You. While I was out for four years, if you're so good, why could you not come near this? Four years I was gone and you didn't come win near. it. Hey, I'm right here, brother. Yeah, now, four where years. were you for four years? 42 fights, I've been whooping Where dudes. were you? Where were you? I was out there working yeah, as an analyst, good, I retired. Good, good. Yeah, I you... retired, and I came back and won the belt against the guy that you were too scared to face, because you know you can't Comedy. beat him. Comedy. Oh, you you yeah, you're gonna f*** yourself up like yeah, usual. You're crazy, man. And you, and you. You zip it, man. Put a quarter in you, little guy. Oh, what are you gonna do? Chase him down? Go.
score of the contest. 50-45, 50-45, and 49-46 for the winner by unanimous decision. And still, Dominic, the Dominator. You mentioned Cody Garbrandt. You obviously watch everyone in the division and a lot of fighters. Is that someone you're looking at already? I know he just had his first major test. But I think that that's somebody that Faber manages and collects a percentage off of. Cody Garbrandt's a champ, man. He's a stud. It has nothing to do with anything other than that. Nothing like you making a percentage off of when he gets good fights. Dominic Cruz came out the other side of the rubber match, the victor, finally putting to rest the Uriah Faber rivalry, solidifying the fact that he was indeed the better fighter, and that perhaps it was inexperience and the moment that had led to his first outing ending the way it had. It was a bittersweet moment for fight fans as one of the longest and storied rivalries came to a close, Dominic remaining the undefeated bantamweight, and Uriah seemingly losing his last shot at championship glory. All those years of chasing each other across weight divisions and sitting on the sidelines injured had culminated in a dominant and decisive victory for the Dominator. But Team Alpha Male wasn't finished with Cruz, and the same night that the conflict had finished, pundits and fighters alike were already expecting Dom to accept a matchup with another member of Team Alpha Male that had been surging through the division, Cody Garbrandt, a fighter that conveniently had a matchup with Mizugaki at UFC 202, with title shot implications at stake. It was at that very event backstage, before the fight, that Dom and Cody would cross paths. Well, he almost already had a fight against the champion here about a, two hours or so before his fight tonight. Just for the for those who did not see our pre-fight show, explain what happened earlier tonight with you and Cody. I mean, it wasn't anything crazy. It was just an exchange of words and understanding and looking at each other in the eye and understanding we're going to see each other very soon, my friend. And An altercation that would further cement the idea if Cody won that night, that he would be the next to face the greatest bantamweight of all time. Cody would put on a flashy and devastating first round finish against Mizugaki and would call out Dom in the post-fight interview, a matchup that Dom would welcome. The UFC cashed in on the storyline and confirmed that at UFC 207, the pair would battle it out for the title. Team Alpha Male's last chance at defeating their longtime rival. Dominic had gone from one fight in just under five years to three title fights in one year. Uriah, on the other hand, was quick to step back in the cage, taking on Jimmy Riviera in September of that same year, but dropping a unanimous decision loss. With two defeats in a row, he would make his retirement plans for a card taking place in his hometown of Sacramento. Uriah had accepted that dropping off the sport in a slow fade out was not the path that he wanted to take. He would rather finish on a high, ranked in the top echelon of the sport, and in the hometown that he was raised in. He would have his wish, a picture book ending defeating legendary UK fighter Brad Pickett and leaving his gloves in the octagon, a final waltz. He would leave the sport just two weeks before his student, Cody, would face Dom for the title. And for that, there was no better legacy for the California kid, a man who had shaped the sport for smaller athletes, a man who had been the catalyst for years of drama and the mentor for dozens of top-ranked and championship-caliber athletes. His legacy as a pioneer near of the sport was undeniable, and to see him go out on a win was a meaningful moment and one not seen for most MMA practitioners, who often have their careers ended after lengthy loss streaks. But his retirement that night would have one more poignant moment, a beautiful and fitting end to a storyline. I started this thing out at 21 years old, 2007, I came in pajama pants because they were all I could afford walking in there. <laughs> Definitely couldn't afford a haircut <laughs> if you watched that, I look like Lloyd Christmas out there, but I got a little <laughs> gift here for you, man, you know, just to, just to bring it up. Uh, just to keep it real. As no, you know, <laughs> this is the thing. It started with that, and it's not gonna end like that, you know? I would say you could write on my face, but guess what? It's not on there. So, <laughs> it's just signed, man. <laughs> there it is. Your pal. Your uh, pal, from right. me to you, man. And that's you know, it. Nothing nothing crafty, nothing mean. Just oh, I laying, appreciate it that, Dom. laying it to I appreciate rest. Laying it to rest, That's it. Well, hey, thank you guys. I, I mean, I, I I feel like I've been so blessed to be on this journey, and, and I've learned so much, and I feel like I've inspired people. I've been inspired, and i um, just been thinking bigger. I want to thank, you know, the, the folks at UFC, the, the new owners, the, the you know, Lorenzo and Frank and, and Dana. They've always treated me with such respect and, and, and sent me out like a champion, so I, I appreciate it. Dom used it. I, I used to think he was acting like a baby, but he did use it for motivation. He's doing good now. I hope he can keep his keep it all together after the fight with, with, with Cody. 
Yeah, so we'll you're going to give him a party shot on the way out, baby? We'll see. You better, get, you better get him a, a reservation at the hospital for that Man, concussion you know he's going to have after that. From one poster to ten years of rivalry, the dust had finally settled on the two men who had made a weight class, their stories weaving in and out of one another, their losses fueling their championship and Hall of Fame earning careers, their wins life-defining moments etched into the history books of mixed martial arts. Strange how one moment, one poster, could be the catalyst for waves of course-altering history, the highs and lows of bantamweights orbiting around two giants that had propelled a weight class into the stratosphere, a poster, a glimpse into time itself. And its legacy is slowly fading as the dawn that set on their rivalry moves further and further into the past. But there was one more Team Alpha Male to put down, an epilogue to a great and enduring odyssey, the final curtain call just two weeks away. Look, I, never put chased, you down I never had a chase pussy in my life on December 30th, I ain't doing it. I don't have to. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> we'll see. So keep your fling on the string, keep your mouth shut, because yeah. this is big boy business. Welcome across there right now, dude. You're a room away. Go ahead, come over here. Yeah. Come on, turd. Let's go. Because he has to be a self-perceived savage. So a savage can't do this, this interview. This is what an alpha, a savage does. He gets mad, he gets angry, and he knocks things out and breaks things and forces things. But with a guy like me, you got to use a different approach, and that's what he's going to find out. Part of it is losing and part of life is losing. I think everybody here can say one time or another, maybe not in a fight, but you felt like a loser. And how do you come back from it? Let's see, you know, I know myself. I've lost before. Dominic Cruz had gone just shy of 10 years without tasting defeat inside the octagon. And to say his reaction to falling foul once more, especially to a man from Team Alpha Male, was anything but humble would be an understatement. He was quickly critical and analytical of his performance and immediately ready to move past it. See, whilst his record was nearly perfect up until this point, his life outside of it, as we know, was anything but. Those moments of death and rebirth on the other side of the chain-linked fence of the octagon had set him up to handle loss with grace and honesty. Team Alpha Male had finally produced a man to take out Dominic in what was perhaps one of the greatest performances in a title fight by any challenger. Cody Garbrandt imbued with an otherworldly essence was propelled to victory by an impossible dream to claim the belt and place it in the hands of a cancer survivor, a pact between a man and a young boy, one to become champion and the other to beat a deadly disease, the fulfilment of which transpired on one of the grandest stages the earth has to offer. It's one of the most inspiring and beautiful stories the sport will ever know. Dominic Cruz, unfortunately, the byproduct of fate fulfilling dreams. A story that I have told before. As wins and losses spread over decades, traversed all the highs and lows of bantamweight and team alpha male history, the next few years following Dominic's loss in the UFC and Cody's inconceivable undefeated rise to the throne would show that this sport is undoubtedly the most ruthless game that an athlete can play. A cruel mistress with a kiss of unmatched death. It, it was good to be be able to at least fight somebody with a with a good heart. I said what I want about the guy, about his smarts and whatnot, but he does have a good heart, and that's important. So um, enjoy being at the top, Cody. You're a young champion. Try to keep it. That's tough. Let's see what you do with it.
Dominic may have faded out of the spotlight for the meantime, but the bantamweight division would stay in motion, and the fallout that Dominic had predicted for Team Alpha Male would manifest in a bitter and brutal rivalry between ex-teammates. Soon after Dom's defeat, he would turn down an immediate rematch with Cody, and so the UFC went with putting Cody in the cage with former bantamweight champion and former Team Alpha Male, TJ Dillashaw, but not before coaching the Ultimate Fighter in a rather heated season. The two would eventually face each other as the co-main event for UFC 217 in November of 2017. TJ would walk away with the championship after knocking Cody out in the second round, and in the background of this, Dominic had been paired up against Jimmy Riviera, a man who was 5-0, undefeated since his UFC debut. But just four days removed from Cody losing the belt, Dominic would pull out of the fight, citing yet again another injury. This time, he had broken his arm. It is hard to put oneself in Dom's shoes at this point. A career already marred by injuries was about to be sidelined again for the foreseeable future. Each step forward for Dom would result in two steps back. A blanket of snow from winter's cold embrace would be melted by spring's new beginnings. A long and arduous recovery process for Dom was simply a blink in time for the sport of MMA as it continued to press on. Summer had arrived and brought with it news of a fresh matchup for Dominic against John Lineker for about to take place in the opening of 2019 at UFC 233, meaning by the time that the bout would happen, Dom would have spent four seasons, an entire year sidelined. In the meantime, TJ Dillashaw would repeat success, closing out the rivalry against Cody Garbrandt by knocking him out in the first round in a grudge match in August of 2018. The division had become an interesting place, and perhaps with one win, Dom would secure himself a shot at the title against a man he had already beaten. But in the winter of 2018, a tale as old as time would repeat itself, as Dominic would report that he had injured his shoulder, taking him out of competition for at least another year. As I researched this whole story of Dom and subsequently began my writing, I was just floored at the cyclical nature of Cruz's injuries. You literally could not make up the course his athletic career was taking. Every time he was close to being healthy, life would deal yet another tragic setback. His fighting legacy was marred by at least seven years of being sidelined at this point. It's a hard fact to comprehend how great this man would have been if not laden with career-halting injuries. Dominic would join Ariel on the MMA Hour to give yet another poignant breakdown of his feelings on the matter, and well, I'd rather let him do the talking, because his words hold so much meaning, words that provide depth and insight to all our lives regardless of being an athlete. Cruz, who was supposed to return to action against John Lineker, had to pull out of his fight, wrote a uh, lengthy and heartfelt statement online, but wanted to talk to him about what happened, um, his road back to recovery once again, trying to get over the injury bug, all that, and then some, he's kind enough to be joining us on the phone. I was, I was sparring Guito Perez, and I threw it, and it landed, and it just, I felt it pop. And unfortunately, this was just the end of the road for that shoulder. The wear and tear took over. With all that being said, how I feel is sadness. Uh, extreme, extreme sadness, to be honest. Um, it hurts. I mean, I want to cry, but this is, you know, this is, a, this is a long road that I've had already. I've already been down this. I've had these injuries. You can attach whatever you want to this situation, but it, it never defeats me, and it never will. It's just part of, the, of my journey. It's going to be part of my legacy, these injuries. And, you know, how many people go through life, you know, with, with problems and have to just, you know, they drop and they got to get back up, drop, get back up. That's really all it is. Life is no different from fighting, and that's why I love fighting so much. You know, sport is a metaphor to life, and that's why everybody connects to sport so heavily. I talked to Dana about it. He called me, him and Shelby, and Dana says, you know, Dom, you're literally, the, and he said this before, you're literally the most unlucky person I've ever heard of or met in my life. I mean, you got this money on the table that you can make. You got these fights that you can go out there and, and compete in, and you just, you keep getting hurt. I, I can sit and take that and go, what do I, what can I do with that, right? What can I do with that information, Dana? What do you want me to do with that information, Dana? And I choose to look at it differently because that, that for me, if I take that and sit with that, that's the mentality that kills human beings every day. I'm unlucky. I can't do this. It's too much. I, I, I. That is a victim mentality, and that will kill you. Because if I hold on to, if I hold on to victim and hold on to the unluckiest human being in the world, then that's what I get to be. It's a blank slate. And instead of writing unlucky human being and... I can't do this, and I choose the opposite, because we're all going to die either way. It's inevitable. When you live life, you're going to go through pain. With such a devastating injury, Dominic would step away from competition indefinitely, once again broken by the intrinsic nature of this sport. With no obvious next contenders at bantamweight, TJ Dillashaw would challenge newly crowned flyweight champ Henry Cejudo in a chance to become a double champion.
can it be? You're here with me. Let's start writing our own history. TJ Dillashaw tested positive for injectable EPO. Oh, this winding, winding road. Let's just take the long way home. In Dominic's absence, the bantamweight division would move on, TJ would be suspended for two years following his failed flyweight venture, and rising talents would begin their ascension up the rankings. The UFC would find the two men to fill TJ's shoes, the destructive Marlon Moraes, and the man who knocked the EPO out of TJ, and current flyweight champion Henry Cejudo, who was looking for double championship glory. around us now and I haven't felt oh I haven't Mark felt Donald has called to stop for this contest at four minutes down. 51 seconds of Let's round number three declaring the winner by T just keep going and you are just two ten up you China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation. We've been closely monitoring the situation with the coronavirus and its potential impact on the health and safety of UFC athletes, staff, and fans around the world. We're moving forward with all our UFC live events. I want somebody that I could break. I want somebody brittle. I want somebody easy. About a tuna fight. Dominic Cruz, I have a message for you. I don't know how you can say you're the best in the world when you're not even the best out of the state of Arizona. Dominic Cruz, you can do me a favor and you can bend the knee to Triple C2. Wash your filthy dog. Dominic Cruz makes his return to the octagon in a bantamweight battle for the belt against Henry Cejudo Saturday at UFC 249. We don't know where he's at physically. He just got off another surgery. It's your first fight, Dominic, since 2016. How does it feel to be finally returning to the octagon? It's been really good. It's been a fun, fun trip so far. Dominic Cruz, does he, does he deserve a shot at the title after such a lengthy layoff? After almost four years away, multiple injuries and a pandemic, Dom would return to the octagon to fight for the bantamweight belt. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Keith Peterson has called a stop to this contest at 4 minutes, 58 seconds of round number 2. Declaring the winner by Keith and still the undisputed UFC Shook his hand and said, I need you to let me go out. This is a title fight. Um, I need you to not be stopping this early. I, and I'm asking you, like, yo, man, let me fight my fight. Let me go out out there if this is going to be stopped. My experience of him was smelling like he had been out all night the night before, like cigarettes and alcohol. In direct contrast with his loss against Cody, Dom was frustrated with the stoppage from Keith Peterson. And to be fair, out of all fighters that called foul on early interventions, Dominic had a fairly good point. It was a stoppage that was questionable, something apparent immediately to the commentators, and certainly fans back at home. And even on re-watching it, it's still very obvious that Dom was still in that fight. But fate had chosen its course, and despite Dom's frustration, the sport would march on. Crews would fade into the fizzled and murky haze of isolation, as the pandemic spread and all our lives changed just a little. After almost another year layoff, Dominic would come back to the fight game and in his absence, the division he ruled over had changed so much. Henry had left the sport and in his stead, Peter Yan had been crowned champion. The top 10, a different landscape than what was once there when Dom reigned as king. Team Alpha Male, a fleeting memory, 
threatening to fade into the dusty corners of fight fans' minds. Dominic was now ranked 11, despite only being in title fights for the last five years. His matchup against unranked Casey Kenny on the prelims of UFC 259 was a testament that this sport moves on at an unforgiving pace. Watching Dom in the face-off live was a reminder of all that had come before for the last several years of this storied set of events. Whilst I have now produced three videos on this whole saga, it's so strange to see the different perspectives on how these wins and losses affected each fighter's lives. Those interwoven stories, an infinitely complex string of narratives, conflicting messages, inspiring tales and saddening declines. Empathy enters a prism that splinters into opposing directions, and whilst those childhood bedtime stories whispered in the night's darkness made sense of good and evil in simplistic ways, real life is a confusing meander through the bittersweet, morally grey hue that coats any and all interactions. The sport of MMA shines its neutral spotlight on the unique journeys of men, all striving for greatness, all flawed, all lost, all searching for meaning in the cosmic vastness, their lives cyclical tales splayed out on strands of web spun by time. If it wasn't obvious, then it is now as we conclude the dissection of this bantamweight saga. Everyone carries a unique story, one of inspiration, one of darkness, one that if analysed too closely would uncover harbouring evil or unearth shimmering beads of greatness. We are so infinitely complex creatures that trying to pull apart this story in a way that presents a good or bad, a right or wrong, is a foolish endeavour. There is only one truth, and that is either victory or defeat. To be frank, there is only life or death. Uriah would briefly retire before making a comeback three years later. After beating a rising talent, he would meet Pewter Yan in the octagon, who would knock him out in the third round. Uriah, another man who thought there was a chance for him at working back towards the title, despite being at the tail end of his career. He would hang his gloves up for the final time on a loss. TJ Dillashaw would return from his controversies, and after getting a split decision win against Sanhagen, would fight for the title against Aljamain Sterling in Abu Dhabi. He would enter the octagon beaten and weathered, his shoulders destroyed through the relentless decades training and competing in this sport. For two rounds he fought with one arm before being TKO'd. After the fight he would retire from the sport. Cody Garbrandt after losing a second time to TJ would go 1-3 in, in his next set of performances, fading out of the rankings altogether. Unfortunately, one of the worst declines the sport has ever seen. Similarly, after losing to TJ the second time, Henan Burrell would go 1-6. in six. The UFC would choose to release him after his last loss in 2019. He has yet to fight since. And finally, Dominic would win his next set of performances against both Casey Kenny and Pedro Munoz. He was seemingly one fight away from another title shot. The UFC would pair him against Marlon Vera, and in much the same way as his prior rivals, this sport would remind Dominic that this game is cruel, ruthless and unforgiving. Dom would be knocked out in the fourth round in a fight that he was handily winning. This is a sport that takes place in an arena where longevity is not discussed. One moment you are at the precipice as a champion, the greatest, and the next you are at the bottom staring up at what had been in. And in spite of poetry, or mysticism, or symbolism, in spite of storytelling, or what any slew of words could offer, this sport is one thing, and that is honest. I'd like to once again thank the sponsor of today's video, Copilot, and remind you guys to click on the link in the description in the pinned comment and get yourself a free trial with an expert fitness and health coach. Copilot really is worth everything that they offer. And finally, thank you guys so much for your patience in this one. It really did take a long time. I'm super proud of the end product and I really hope that you guys enjoyed. And uh, yeah, see you guys next time.